All right, Psalm 103, verse 1. Oh, we could go on and on, but uh, especially verse 3. Underline verse 3. But it says in verse 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Here's His benefits for you. Who forgives all. Everyone say all. Who forgives all your iniquities. Who heals all. Everyone say all. Your diseases. How many? Some of them. If you're good, he doesn't put any conditions on this. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. He goes on and says, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. You know what good things he satisfies your mouth with? His word. This word shall not depart out of your mouth so you keep this word in your mouth by muttering saying it over and over and over again he forgives all my iniquities he heals all my diseases probably the number one hindrance of people receiving their healing is guilt because of sin well he's forgiven all your sin i mean that that's not standing in the way you need to underline that verse three he heals all your diseases there is no sickness, no disease that belongs to you. They belong to the devil. All right, Isaiah 53. We quote it a lot, but I want you to look at it and underline it. Isaiah chapter 53. Let's start in verse 4. It says, it's talking about Jesus. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. There is no reason for you to be lonely or depressed ever again, starting today. If you're lonely or depressed, it's not God. You say, yes, but it just things are really sad around me. Jesus wants to make your joy full. He bore your griefs and carried your sorrows. He took them. So if you've got them, they don't belong to you. They're not yours. Quit playing with the devil's toys. You know, I'm really surprised at how rough God's been speaking to hearts and lives this weekend. Get off your butt. Shut up and listen. You know, I mean, these words, from, you know, thus saith the Lord. Get off your butt and shut up and listen and do the word. I'm thinking, man, sound like my dad. <laughs> he is. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Now verse 5 is what you need to underline especially. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Everyone say, we are healed. Now this is stuff that's already been done. It's already happened. It's past tense. So if you have sickness and disease, hey, it's been paid for. You might as well receive the healing and walk in it. Now, if you don't know it's been paid for, it's hard to walk in. But you can know that it's been paid for and have a revelation of this. Remember what we talked about last night? Getting a revelation of God's Word by meditating on it day and night. You need to take that and say it over and over and over and over and over again. Maybe you need to just sit down with these verses and a piece of paper and a pencil and say it a hundred times and just put a little notch when it, you know and then five dun, 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 and say it again five and then say it a hundred times just make yourself sit down and say it over and over and over and over again you say but that's boring no it gets more exciting the more you say it why because the reality of the living power of God's Word fills your soul and then no one can ever take it away from you all right one more. Um, First Peter. Which is basically a quote of Isaiah 53, but 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Peter's writing, he says, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, 
might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. You've been healed already. It's already been done. What would happen if you sat down at the dinner table, your mom puts your food in front of you, you go, Mom, may I have dinner, please? She was just right there in front of you. Eat it. No, no, but Mom, I'm not worthy. But may I have dinner? She goes, eat your food. Oh, but Mom, wouldn't that be stupid if you did that? Why? It's right there. It's been provided. It's in front of you. It's yours. It belongs to you. All we got to do is pick up the fork and eat it. It's right in front of us. And it's already been done. It's established. Healing. So everyone say, healing is mine. It's been paid for. It has my name on it. It belongs to me. And the roof is leaking. You can move if you want. I mean, it, don't get the camera wet. I mean, it's dripping right on her, right there. It's amazing. It's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's amazing. <laughs> okay. I think the ice is melting or something. I don't know. I don't want to talk about what it might be then. <laughs> How come everyone always thinks the worst? You know? I said, I don't, you know, could be, you know, a pipe is sweating or something. Everyone else is thinking toilets or something. I don't know what you're thinking. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, the Word is good. Okay. We're talking about meditating on the Word. Let's just do it. Let's go for it. Shall we? Yes, we shall. Turn your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Timothy was a young pastor. In fact, he ended up being the pastor of probably one of the largest churches in the area. In fact, John, the apostle, you know, they couldn't kill the guy. They uh, persecuted him. They tried to stop him. They boiled him in oil. Can you imagine getting French fried? I mean, they boiled him in oil. And he came out smiling. They dunked him in the boiling oil. He comes out and, hello, <laughs> you know. They couldn't kill him, so they just tried to get rid of him. They put him on an island. That was a mistake. Because guess who was on the island with him? <laughs> Jesus showed up, glow-in-the-dark Jesus, and gave him the last book of the Bible and told him all about what was getting ready to happen. The book of Revelation is so amazing to me because John was seeing things. He was seeing helicopters and army tanks. Uh, he was seeing stuff that had not been created or thought of or... I mean, you know, you go through and you read it, and it says, they were like locusts. I mean, what are you going to describe it with? What are you going to compare it to? They were like giant locusts, and the fire was spitting out of their mouths. It was helicopters flying through the air, shooting bombs. But John had never seen a helicopter before. What's he going to compare it to? And all these guys in the Old Testament saw things. They saw into the future. They saw the last days. All this stuff that's been created in the last hundred years. Nobody had ever seen it before. I mean, cars, televisions, uh, guns, uh, you know, different kind of things that we have now. They, they didn't know, so they had to try and describe it. It was like this and it was like that. It was like lions, you know, running across the thing. They were seeing army tanks. They didn't know what those things were. It is so wild. So John's out there on the Isle of Patmos, getting the revelation, writing it all down. And then uh, some history says that John came back uh, off the Isle of Patmos and was in Timothy's church. That would have been a lot of pressure, you know, <laughs> having John, the disciple of Je whom Jesus loved, who got all this revelation, who they couldn't kill, sitting on the front row of your church, and you're up there trying to teach him something. I know a little bit how that feels. I was preaching one time at our church, and I'm in the back room, the guest room, getting ready, and Gloria Copeland walks in. I'm in the guest room. She walks in, and she's so sweet. I mean, she comes over, and she's helping me. She's fixing my collar and stuff, you know. <laughs> and I go out there, I'm preaching. She's sitting on the front row taking notes. Talk about a humbling experience. 
I mean, that's a humbling experience. So here's Timothy. He's a young pastor. He's got this huge church. Things are growing. John retires in his church. I mean, this is just a wild situation. Timothy, God put a lot on this young man. And uh, as a young man, Paul writes to him in this letter and says a couple of things that, uh, that are important for us to get a hold of. Now look at this in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and starting in verse 12. He says this, Let no one despise your youth, or let no one despise you because you are young, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, or to the word. All of those are the word. In verse 13. Do not neglect the gift that is in you which was given you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. What's he talking about? He's talking about meditating on the Word. That's why it says in verse 13, Now, th this, what if you took this as God's Word to you? How many of you are young? Uh, Dr. Whitaker just recently uh, said that uh, uh, in... Uh, estimations of the reality of life, how it really ought to be that 60 is middle age. Because God's promised us 120 years. 60, you're only halfway there. I knew you would, Steve. I said it for you. Hallelujah. And me. I'm young too, man. I'm just a kid. Glory to God. <laughs> You know, they're, they're, in a, they're really, really, there is not a kid in here. There's not one kid in here. There's young men and women of God in here. There's not one kid. So if there's any question in your mind about whether or not you're a man or a woman, let me settle it once and for all. All the young men stand up. All the young men stand up. Stand up. Young men. I want you to lift your right hand. And I want you to say this with me. From this day forward, I am a man. I'm not a kid. I'm not a child. I am a man. Sit down. All the young women stand up. All the young women, stand up. Raise your right hand. Say, from this day forward, I am a woman. And let it be known, I'm not a kid. I'm not a child. I am a woman of God. Amen. Sit down. Men and women. All right. Young men and women. Paul writes, he says, let no one despise your youth. In other words, you could take this verse 12 and put it this way. Let no one despise you because you are young by being example to the believers in these particular areas. Be an example to the believers. To the, now you're young, but you can be an example to the believers of all ages. Most revivals that have occurred happened with young people right in the middle of them, young men and women. Princeton, Yale, some of the most uh, prestigious institutions of our country were started by revivals of young men and women. I bet you didn't know that. So some of you, it's like, whoa. God started it. And uh, that's how it was founded. Uh, now things don't always continue in the same vein, you know, most of the denomination were a move of God. I mean, the Methodists, they were all speaking in tongues. The Quakers, uh, they called them Quakers because they couldn't stop shaking because the power of God would come on them so strong that just... <laughs> That's why they called them Quakers. There's another group called Shakers. Same thing. 
They call them that. I mean, it's like we, we could have been called like chandelier swingers. And then maybe if that would have caught on, it would have been a denomination. Chandelier swingers. But the Quakers, that, you know, that's why they were named that. Because the Spirit of God would come upon them and they would quake. And they couldn't stop. They're not doing a whole lot of quaking anymore. <laughs> no, that's true. There's not a whole lot of quaking going on. Mama? Be an example to the believers of all ages in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Your faith can be an example to the believers. Your faith. Your faith. You start believing God for things. Your conduct, your, your devotion to God. Your, see, you guys have the energy. Okay? Some of those other people think they're old. And so they're not moving so fast anymore. But last night when you're dancing, you were created to dance. I heard Kenneth Copeland uh, talking about this one time. You know, people, people have come down on different styles of music. And, and uh, the biggest thing that a lot of people have attacked is the beat. The beat of the music. Oh, that's the devil's beat. I heard Kenneth Copeland say this. He said, that's not the devil's beat. God created that beat when he put a heart in every man and woman on the face of the earth. No wonder when that music starts, you want to move. Why? You were created that way. So what are you going to do in church? You need to be an example to the believers. You need to take that energy and channel it for the Lord and be an example to the believers and let your devotion be contagious and get out of you on everybody else. You could turn your church on fire, man. You could. And I'm not talking about shaking your booty down. All right? I'm not talking about a flesh thing. I'm talking about you love Jesus so much that you can't stand still. That kind of thing. That's an example to the believers. Now this last one, you know, we could go through and talk about each one of these, but for sake of time, we're just going to look at some major deals. Be an example to the believers in purity. Now this is an issue that needs to be addressed in our generation. Because there's probably nothing uh, as devastating as sexual sins in the body of Christ in the realm that we're dealing with. And, uh, you know, you start talking about sex and things like that, and things get real quiet like they did right now. And uh, because it's been this weird mystery, you know, it's been this secret thing, and it's just our generation has taken it such a mystique about it. Nobody ever talks about it. But uh, so many people get in trouble with it. I mean, it is so common, but everyone's just like, we're not going to say anything about it. This is the most normal thing in the world. God created sex. It was his idea. Amen. I mean, he made it exciting, too. He says, Adam, you know, Adam gets done naming all the animals, and there's still this kind of emptiness inside of him. You know? I mean... He's naming all the animals, and that, there's all two of them. There's, all two, two, there's a male and a female of all the animals. And Adam names them all, and it's like it dawns on him that he's the only one on the planet that there's only one of. So God says, Adam, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Take a nap. Take a nap. When you don't think you can control yourself anymore, take a nap. Who knows? Maybe you'll have dreams and visions. God said you would. You're that generation. So Adam falls asleep. God takes a rib out, makes a woman. Whoa, man. Brings her to Adam. I mean, God makes a big deal out of this thing. God knew what he was doing. He made a big deal out of it. Puts the man, you know, he could have said, okay, Adam, lift up your arm. And God could have gone, Wah! you know, pull the rib out. Bleh! A woman. Cool. No, he made a big deal out of it. Adam goes to sleep, okay. All right. And he brings the woman to the He makes this big deal out of it. Brings the woman to the man and ta-da! <laughs> wow! Man. 
made a big This was God's idea. And they didn't need clothes because they were clothed with the glory of God. And it was pure. And it was right. And it was good. You know, I, how many of you grew up on a farm? Not very many. No wonder it got so quiet. No wonder... Dwayne, I believe it. Why do I believe that? I don't know. You grew up on the farm. You know what? You grew up on a farm? You know what? Sex is no mystery to someone who grows up on the farm. I mean, think about it. I mean, all you got to do is walk outside. And something's doing it. I mean, the dogs, the horses, the pigs, the cows, they're all out there. You grow up on the farm. Isn't that right, Dwayne? I mean, you walk out, it's like, whoa. Making bacon. Oh, my goodness. What's going on here? This is not some big mystery. This is not some big mystery. And we treat it like it is. Oh, don't talk about that. Shh. All you got to do is go to a public high school, walk in the bathroom, it's fully illustrated. So why don't we ever talk about it? No, because it's just, we're not supposed to talk about it. It's the coolest thing in the world, it's great. And some of you are going, oh Jesus, don't come, wait till I get married, so I can do it, just once. I'm serious, there's a whole lot of young people thinking that. And when someone gets up here, you know that one little guy comes up here, he had a word from the Lord, I am coming soon. And it struck fear on a lot of phases. <laughs> Give yourself entirely to them so that your progress may be evident to all. Think about an Olympic runner for a second. You know what their whole life consists of? Running. And that's all. What have they done? They have meditated and given themselves entirely to that one thing. That one thing, and they've become good at that thing, maybe the best in the world at that one thing. Why? Their life consists of one thing. Just one thing. Whew, talk about a focus. So God says, don't neglect the gift that is in you, but make it the one thing. Now this is God's word for you. You know, It says, don't let anyone despise you because you are young. This is talking to you. Take that gift inside of you and meditate on it day and night. Not just the Word, but your Word. Give yourself entirely to it so that your progress may be evident to all. It is evident the progress that people that go into the Olympics make. It's evident. Why? It's their whole life. There's only one way to get that good, and that's to give yourself entirely to it. You know why a lot of people in the body of Christ aren't better at what they do? They haven't given themselves entirely to it. It is not their whole life. You say, yeah, but you know, you know, you can have fun and you can enjoy life and give yourself entirely to something. I'm having a blast. I'm going all over the world. I'm going to Australia. I've been to Russia. I, I go all over the place. I'm working for an organization that is worldwide. I mean, I'm having the time of my life. I'm not sitting around going, gosh, I've missed so much. <laughs> I'm doing it. And it's not because I'm pursuing traveling or pursuing... You know, you get the Word inside of you and you'll go. It'll make you go. You know? It'll make you start things. It'll make you establish things. It'll make you change people's lives when you give yourself entirely to it. It's cool. So that your progress may be evident to all then he says, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine, which is the word. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Oh, that's cool. It's not just for you. It's you get full of this stuff so you can help other people. Now, uh, look at verse 18 along these same lines of chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. Because this ties right into this, I mean, just perfectly. 1 Timothy 1.18 This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. 
How do you wage warfare in this life? By the prophecies or the words that God has given to you. He says, by these prophecies, you wage the warfare. So when the devil comes against you and gives you a lie, maybe about your health or about you know, who you are in Christ or whatever, he's trying to lay some guilt trip on you, you take what God has spoken to you and you speak it out. That is the word of your testimony. What God says about you. And that's what will change the situation. Why? The devil can't stand up to the word. He can't. He's surrounded by the results of the word. And when you line up with the word, there is no opposition. He can't fight you. That's why when the devil came to Jesus, he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. He did not say, well, devil, in my opinion, I'm the son of God, and you should leave me alone. <laughs> he didn't give him his opinion. He didn't go by, you know, he was the son of God, he had authority, but he didn't even go by his own authority. He went by the authority of the word. And the devil couldn't fight it. It said, then the devil leaveth him. How many of you want the devil to leaveth you? And angels came and ministered to him. How many of you want angels to come minister to you? <laughs> I love this stuff. You wage the good warfare by taking the words that God has given to you and speaking them. Speaking them. Got to. All right? That's how you become an example to the believers is by filling yourself with the word. Then you can't help it what you become it's not something you do it's something you become you need to become that example by filling yourself with the word you know you could be good you could go back to your church and just be good you know just be a nice person just be good not make any waves just be nice but it would have no spiritual impact on your surroundings but if you fill yourself with the word then you become that example then everywhere you go that example of what you are in Christ just exudes from you. And it gets on people and it's contagious. You imagine walking, you know, down the grocery store aisle and people getting healed. Walking down the hall at school and kids popping up out of wheelchairs. You say, well, could that happen? Oh, yeah. Peter and these guys showed up in town. Everybody freaked out. They all lined up in the street, laid at the sick and the lame along the street so that just a shadow would touch them. Talk about faith happening. I mean, wherever they went, faith just rose. Why? These guys, things happen wherever they went. You're the same way. Actually, you, <laughs> this is amazing. These guys were right in the Word. They, didn't, they couldn't turn to 1 Corinthians. They didn't have it. They were passing these letters around to the churches. They didn't have this thing. This thing wasn't compilated and put together until centuries later. But they were living what they knew. What they took, they gave themselves to it. And there were results. And you have this. And you can fill yourself with it. And there's an acceleration in the spirit realm in this generation that is beyond anything anyone has ever seen. There's a scripture verse in one of the prophets. Billy Brim was at our church and she was preaching on this. It talks about the former rain and the latter rain and then the former and the latter rain together. Talking about the outpouring of the Spirit. And she said the former rain was the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out on all flesh and you know they ran out into the street and 3,000 people got saved that day. That was the former rain when all of that was taking place and the early church was birthed. Then she explained that the latter rain was at the beginning of the century when all of a sudden people started receiving the Holy Ghost and healing started beginning. And, and it's like it was resurged once again in the beginning of the century. And along with it came all the technology that we have today. The Spirit of God moved on this century and everything just popped up. Think of the technology. I mean, it's incredible. You could have revival worldwide from one place. You could have meetings and the, the, the Spirit of God could move from that place all over the world at the same time. The Copelands did it with a world communion service back a bunch of years ago. And uh, Paul Yonggi Cho, pastor of the world's largest church in Seoul, Korea, and the church in South Africa, and 
churches in America and churches all over the place, by satellite, were sharing with one another, having communion at the same time. Imagine the spiritual impact of that. Imagine how nervous the devil got. I mean, there's a, there's a resurgence with all of the spiritual move in our generation. There's been a, a, a surge in every other area as well as a result of it. Now, that was the latter rain at the beginning of this century. And now we're coming into the former and the latter rain together. In other words, the spiritual impact of the birth of the church and the spiritual impact that uh, launched this century together at the same time. And you are it. You're it. It's going to happen through you. Can you imagine all the power that God has ever poured out on the earth, pouring out on the earth again through you? Stretch your brains, man. Because it's happened. It's going to happen whether you want to be a part of it or not. Because it's God's timing. Oh gosh, I've got all the... Because it's God's timing. Oh gosh, I've got all these verses and stuff. Okay, go over to Psalm 119. Longest chapter in the whole Bible. Let's read it. Verse 1. No, we're not going to do that. What is there? There's like 160, 176 verses in this chapter. The longest chapter in the whole Bible, and all of it talks about the word whenever it says your judgments your testimonies uh, your commandments your word your statutes all of it's your all of it's his word all of it okay let's look at a few and let's center in on this because I want to touch on this verse 9 Psalm 119 verse 9 how can a young man cleanse his way Who's it talking about? Young men, young people, young men and women. How can a young man cleanse his way? It's talking about purity. By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. You know what that is? Meditation. With my lips, I have declared the judgments of your mouth. I have spoken your word. That's meditation. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much in all riches. Verse 15, I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. Look at verse 17. Deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Verse 18, open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. What is that? Revelation knowledge. This whole chapter is full of this. Now I want to touch on this because this is a major issue in our generation. How shall a young man cleanse his way? There's a lot of young people that have gotten caught up in lust, pornography, watching the wrong things on television, and those things stimulate you and stir you up in the flesh. And if you watch it, you will be stirred up in the flesh. It'll get your flesh going. It was designed to do that. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. What you spend time meditating on is what's going to stimulate you. I like what Steve said yesterday about certain things that offended him in his spirit. It's the more word you get inside of you, the more sensitive to the spirit you become. And when you see something that is, that is opposite of the word of God, it grieves your spirit. And you're opposed to it. But if you acquire a taste for the things of the flesh, then you won't be grieved in your spirit. And you won't be stopped. There's no restraint. You just fall into sin. And there's many young people that have created a pattern in their lives of falling into sin especially in this area because maybe they're hungry for love or maybe they're insecure. They have these uh, lack areas in their heart and in their soul 
because they have not taken the time to meditate on and fill themselves with the Word. It's difficult to fight lust. It's difficult to fight those desires that are inside of you and that are becoming strong because those things are very real and God put those desires on the inside of you. But you don't have to go around stimulating those desires all the time, you know? It's like you're going to go on a diet in front of the donut store? I think not. Why? Because you're going to smell that fresh baked bread and all of that good stuff all the time and you're on a diet? No way. Well, neither are you going to defeat lust and those desires in your life by sitting there watching that stuff on TV, looking at those magazines, you know? And I'm not talking about pornography magazines. I'm talking about, you know, just the girl magazine, you know, Cosmopolitan, stuff like that. Even GQ magazine. I mean, it's got a lot of garbage in there. And you don't need to be looking at it. So how can a young man cleanse his way? How do you defeat those things in your life? By filling yourself up with the Word, and the Word will fight it. You don't have to fight it. Let the Word fight it. And you can win with the Word. You read through this Psalm 119. You know, some of you think marriage is going to solve a lust problem. It doesn't. Marriage was not designed to solve a lust problem. Marriage was designed for love. Lust has no part of a marriage. Lust is evil. It's ungodly. And we need, to, we need to create and develop in us the same kind of response to sin and to uncleanness as God has. Uh, over in Proverbs it says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. That's a strong word. To hate it. Uh, Smith Wigglesworth had a hatred for, sin, for uh, sickness. He developed a hatred for it. He hated it. He saw it like God saw it. He saw it as an attack from the devil to destroy people's lives. And when someone would come up with some hideous sickness or disease, it would just repulse him. Not the person would repulse him, but the fact that the devil put this sickness on this human being. And they weren't created to have sickness and disease. And it made him angry. Oh, it made him angry. Well, he had developed that inside of himself by spending time in the Word and spending time with God. And he saw the thing the way God saw it. And the, the, the judgment of God against sickness would come out of him. I mean, someone would come up with like a goiter, a growth on the side of their neck that would be like as big as a melon. Be hanging out there all purple and veiny and gross looking. Hideous. Couldn't even go out in public. It would scare people. They'd come up in a healing line and it would make him so mad. He'd just hit it. He'd just haul off and belt it, knock it out of him. And they would have brand new skin. Couldn't even tell anything was ever there. Totally healed. He wasn't lashing out against the person. They didn't do that. He attacked the devil. you got to acquire the same kind of uh, desires and feelings against sin that God has. The fear of the Lord is hate sin. The more word you get into your life, the more you're going to hate sin. You'll hate it. You'll, hate, you'll see a little bit of it. It'll re repulse you. Finally, you just shut the TV off and say, there's nothing on. Nothing on there is going to help me. <laughs> I mean, this stuff will get so strong inside of you. We could go through all... There's, there, there's like... There's eight times where my Bible specifically mentions meditate in Psalms 119. There's a whole lot more verses in there that infer it, that lean that direction. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By filling himself with the Word. Young people, you've got those desires. God put them inside of you. They're supposed to be there. They're there for the person that you love, to show affection towards, the person that you're going to marry. Don't go around looking for the person. You, let me give you a clue here, okay? I'll just give you a little personal testimony. I went to Christ for the Nations. I had been not being saved. I had had girlfriends, and, uh, you know, God really protected me. The grace of God was upon me. I wasn't saved, but I didn't fall into uh, sin in that area, and it was by the grace of God. It wasn't because of me. It was by the grace of God. It wasn't a decision that I made. God was just good to me. But I had, had been used to going steady with girls, girl after girl going steady, and it was like a security thing for me. So I went to Bible, got saved, go to Bible school, 
And uh, the girls all, at Bible school were all paranoid. Mostly because there were these weird guys at school that would go around door to door and knock, knock, knock. God told me I was supposed to marry you. <laughs> you know, so they're like freaking out. I mean, they were really there. I'm serious. I knew, I knew those guys. And they were there. And they were, you know, praying. And Anyway, they weren't hearing from God. But anyways, so all the girls were paranoid. So I'd go up and say hi to some, you know, you go say hi to a girl. Hi, how you doing? <laughs> I mean, they would freak out because it's like m most of the young people that came there had been, you know, all messed up, and then they come to Bible school to get things right and to get on with God. So they're responding that way. Well, I got tired of this, and uh, I just gave it to God. I said, God, I don't care. I said, if you ever want me to have a girlfriend, if you ever want me to get married whatever. I said, God, I am putting that part of my life totally on you. I'm giving it to you. It is yours. It is not mine anymore. You do it. If I'm ever going to get married, it's because you did it. Because I'm not going to do it. My parents have been divorced. I didn't want to go through that. I said, I'm going to have to know that I know that I know that I know that I know that I've got the right person because I'm going to be with them forever. So I just gave it to God. About a week later, I met Cindy. And it wasn't like bells and whistles and angels singing. She was in my drama class. And we got into ministry together. And we started praying together. And we started ministering together. And we were great friends. And it was awesome. I was praying about it one day. And I asked the Lord, I said, God, is Cindy the one I'm supposed to marry? And God said, yes. I said, give me a verse. He gave me a verse in Ecclesiastes. It says, two are better than one. For they have a good reward for their labor. For if one falls, they'll have the other to lift them up. And if two lie together, they shall have heat. I thought, that sounds like marriage to me. I mean, he, he gave me the Scripture reference. I didn't know what Ecclesiastes 4, whatever it was, said. I didn't know what it said. You know? I mean, if he'd give me something in Song of Solomon, it would have made a lot of sense to me, you know? Oh, my love, I love your lips, oh, your neck, your oh, lovely, your thighs and your feet. And, you know, it's like, whoa. But it was Ecclesiastes 4 or something, you know, and, and so I'm going, Ecclesiastes. So I look it up, and I'm reading it, two or better than one, and that was my confirmation. I stood on the Word. I mean, uh, the, the relationship was established on the Word. So I knew she was the one I was supposed to marry. And so I did my best to follow the Lord and how to go about that. And, you know, following God. We got married. Went on our honeymoon. Oh, you know, young people. Phew. There is something to be said for going on your honeymoon and not having six or eight or ten other people's faces in your brain. You've got one person on your mind and that's the person you're with. There's no comparison going on it's like that's a person you love that's a person you married that's a person you're going to spend the rest of your life that is so awesome you know i know people that you know have just struggled with it and had bad uh situations in their relationships because of their previous experience and all the comparison all the junk whatever doors you open to the devil are the doors you're going to be fighting to keep closed the rest of your life Please believe me, I've counseled people in their 40s and 50s and 60s and marriages and all of this stuff. And they had problems. And I said, when did this problem start? Well, when I was a teenager, 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 I did this. When I was a teenager, I did that. Most people's problems start when they're a teenager. They open some door to the devil, establish some habit in the flesh, and that's the habit that they fight the rest of their life. What would happen if there was a generation of young people who had never opened any doors? Never any opportunity for guilt consciousness. Just faith flowing freely, unhindered. Just faith, being able to just shoot through you, making things happen. Some of you have opened some doors. Some of you haven't. 
For those of you that haven't, you haven't missed a thing. You have not missed anything. The greatest testimony in the world is that you're unspotted from it. <laughs> That's the greatest testimony. In our generation it is. You know, don't be looking for some great testimony. Oh, I killed 42 people and ate them with a spoon. Bless God, and now I'm saved. Everyone goes, ooh, ah. The greatest testimony in our generation is to stand up and say, I've never drank, I've never smoked, I've never taken drugs, I've never had sex. I'm looking forward to it, but... I've never opened any of those doors to the devil. That's a testimony kept by the grace of God. Man. But some of you have opened some doors. You know what? You can close them today, right now. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to his word. We can initiate some things here, but you're going to have to make a commitment. A commitment to fill your life with the word instead of the world. As you fill your life with the word instead of the world, then you'll be that example to the believers automatically. It will happen. You won't have to make it happen. You won't have to try to make it happen. You will be. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we wrap up this weekend, I pray for all these young people, especially the ones, Lord, have been, who have been struggling with things that the devil has come against them and caused problems with in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth I release the power of God to keep these young people by the grace and mercy of Almighty God I want you to pray this prayer with me say Heavenly Father I dedicate my body to your service it's my reasonable service to give myself to you I will renew my mind according to and your word Will, will heal my body, will fill me with your love, and make my way straight. I receive the will of God for my life, and I'm going to go with it in the name of Jesus. Now, if you've opened doors to the devil and you've been struggling with certain things, especially in this area of purity, to be pure is so cool. That means you're free. I just want you to receive right now the grace and ability of God to help you in that area right now. You know, you don't have to fight it and struggle with it anymore. You can rest in the grace of God. And He'll, by His Word, He'll overcome it. And it won't be an issue anymore. Oh, just let everyone lift up your hands to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we receive, Father, your grace, your abundant ability on our behalf. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. 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 Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to say this prayer with me again. I, I want you to say this. I renounce the spirit of lust and uncleanness that has marked my generation. I back off from it. I no longer will walk in it. But I separate myself unto God for His service. I'm going to walk clean. I'm going to walk holy. I'm going to walk pure by the power of the Word of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Pure, clean, no sin, no sin, no sin, no sin, no sin. Oh, what a great feeling. No sin, none, no sin. Nothing between you and God. Nothing between you and success. Nothing between you and the blessings He has for you. Nothing. It's yours. You just take it. Oh, it's awesome. It's an awesome walk. I love you guys. I appreciate you having me here. I'm excited about what God's going to do in your lives. The world ain't seen nothing yet. It's your turn. It's your turn. How many of you got Mo? Okay, Steve, come on.
Ellis.